And anyway, one of the press that went along uh, got in touch with me and said, uh, I've managed to get into the, the uh, X Factor press conference. Um, I'm going to try and ask about your campaign, but the chances are it ain't going to happen. But I just thought I'd better let you know. I was like, oh, brilliant. Thanks very much. But, you know, I don't expect it to happen. Anyway, he got asked. He actually got one of the questions directly to the panel. And the question was, what do you think about this campaign to get Rage Against the Machine to number one, to stop you getting a Christmas number one? Cal basically comes out and says that uh, the guy doing it is cynical and stupid. It's a stupid campaign, um, and I think it's pathetic. And that was gold dust. That was it. As soon as he said that, round it went on the internet. That was it. Who is this guy that's fucked Simon Cowell off? This is brilliant. So what he actually did, he, actually, he, he, he knocked himself down. Because the fact that he negatively reacted to me, so many thousands and thousands and thousands of people suddenly found the page and joined it. And I kid you not, we, uh, we, we added about 90,000 people in about an hour, all right? It was fucking nuts. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. I, ha I had Facebook ring me. Actually, someone at Facebook got my number and rang me and said, um, you know you've got the fastest growing Facebook group we think we've ever had. We're not sure, but th we, we, we just don't, we can't keep up with it. The page went down. It actually got traffic so much that it went down. It was gone. Um, well, that's the official line, anyway. Um, what I found out afterwards is that, is that some members of Sony Records, bless them, had decided to mass report it uh, so that it would get taken down by Facebook servers. Um, which, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what you call having a mole in the right area, you know. Um, because uh, there was a couple of Rage fans that worked for Sony, and um, they told me. They told me what was going on. So I basically were, got in touch with Facebook and said, well, okay, that's all very well, but uh, I'm going to be on ITV News at 6 o'clock tonight, and if the page isn't there, I'm just going to have to go on and tell them, live to the nation, that you've taken the page down. So you're going to be really popular, aren't you? And funny enough, it returned within an hour. <laughs> so all this crap that you can't get hold of Facebook, if, if they're worried, they, trust me, they will get hold of you, I can assure you. Anyway, so the, as you can see, that. The media, the PR, this was PR dreamland for me. This was like, well, so many people know about it now. So I've got great PR. Um, I've got loads of thousands of people on a Facebook group, so the social side of it's um, good. Um, but that's crap. That's no good unless you've got clear communication. And it's the same with any Facebook group, any Facebook page, Twitter, the lot, OK? I can't stress it enough. You can have all those other building blocks. But if you don't communicate to your fans or to the people what you actually want them to do, uh, I mean, do you want them to buy a record? Tell them. Tell them you want to buy a record, you know? Don't just ask them, you know, is it nice weather where you are? But who cares? And so what we did, I call it spoon feeding, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think if you do it carefully without being condescending um, and just tell people, right, I want you, and this is what I did, I said, I want you to buy this track Here's the link. I've got the link already for you, which I didn't do last year. Here's the correct link, which I didn't do last year. Um, and all the learnings of where I'd cocked up previously, I'd communicated the entire lot to the group. And by this time, we had about 700, 750,000 fans, you know, and growing and growing. And you can see on the right, it, it looks a bit strange, but in those days, Facebook didn't do a thumbnail for your group or your page. For some bizarre reason, if you made it oblong and really long like that, it would fill up the whole page. So I thought, well, hang on a minute. If I make it really oblong and anyone shares that, it takes the whole screen up. So if I get them to press the share button, it won't just share the thumbnail. In those days, it takes the whole bloody screen. It takes the whole screen up. So if any of your friends share it, they have to see it. Like, there's, there's no way they can, they can miss that. So I turn the, um, the, the group logo, the group photo, if you will, into a little news ticker. And if you, you probably can't see quite well there, but I basically was giving news on that. Because if anyone pressed share, anyone that wasn't a fan or didn't know about the campaign would know exactly what's going on, when we're doing it, and uh, what they've got to do. And so, um, so anyway, so I was communicating as much as I could. I was trying to sneak my way onto telly, radio, you name it. I was doing that. I was whoring myself big time with the media. Um, anyway, chart week came. 
And what was great about Chart Week in 2009, so this is the week where the seven days where all the sales count towards the Christmas number one. The X Factor final had just happened. Joe McKeldry, if you remember him, uh, he won the X Factor uh, with his amazing song, The Climb. And um, we... Uh, no, you can have a laugh, it's fine, it's all right. It's, uh, it's, uh, I've done my laughing, I promise you. Um, but uh, the Chart Week, it was, it was really, really snowy. Okay, throughout the whole UK, it was really wintry. And, um, and I was finding out that, because uh, we didn't have a physical single to sell, we only had downloads. The X Factor had a physical single, and they had downloads as well. And sadly for retailers that week, because of the snow and it was really heavy, the sales were down on uh, physical CDs and singles, which is terrible, really. It really broke my heart that year. And so it felt like somebody up there was smiling and was a Rage fan. So the chart week came, and um, things were, I was trying to keep it as smooth as possible. And as I said, I was trying to keep the PR going. I was trying to keep all the social and the digital sides going. Um, making sure the communication was correct and not taking the foot off the gas. So making sure all of those elements are still there. And again, I do it for every single campaign I do. Um, anyway, uh, five hours. This is the last ever Saturday. Okay. Actually, a question. Yeah. So what were you doing at that time to make a living while you were doing all these things? Good question, Tommy. Um, I was working for a company called Richer Sounds, which is a hi-fi, uh, they've got a few stores out and about. It always makes Ian go to the toilet, don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I was working in a hi-fi uh, company. However, um, one part of this, which um, I'll get onto in a bit, but I'll tell you now actually, is that I used to work in their marketing department. And in 2007, um, I'm glad you asked this actually, in 2007 I went to the marketing director of Richard Sounds and said, I've got this idea which will save us money, save us money. Um, this thing called Facebook, you know, this social media thing, we should really put more effort into that because it's going to, you know, I'm buying adverts for you guys every week, it's costing a lot of money. We can halve that budget easy and just go onto this social media and find our fans, find our customers there. And the, the response was like, well, you're not privy to everything we do. Just, you know, go and do your work. Just go on. Yeah. And I, I basically was kind of sort of shunned out of the office. And I thought, OK, fine. Well, I'm not going to give you any, any more suggestions ever again then. And a lot of the ideas I had was about Facebook and about uh, breaking Facebook groups and sending messages out that way. So I thought, well, sod it, I'll do it myself. So there's a little story there. Um, so I was, yeah, I was at Richard Sounds, but before I was doing this, uh, they didn't want me in the marketing department, so I changed departments and I was in the logistics department. So I wasn't good enough to do marketing, apparently. I wasn't good enough, so never mind. So anyway, so yes, I was at Richard Sounds. And, and I was, it was nine to five, and I was juggling this as well as um, being, you know, my dad to three kids and, you know, it was near Christmas and Christmas shopping. So that's what was going on. And just to tie back into this, uh, the Saturday, so Saturday is the last day you can buy any sales towards a Christmas chart. Um, I was in the middle of Chelmsford. Uh, again, it was snowing, quite heavy snow, and I got a phone call. And I was, I, my, my son was in a push chair at the time when I was pushing my son. And I got a phone call, and it's like, hi, we're, um, we're ringing on behalf of Joe Wiley. Um, we'd, we'd like, if possible, to do a recorded snippet of you, if you like, because we want to do a little bit of a little feature later on um, about your campaign. And by this time, if you remember, I, obviously I was on the front page of the mirror. I've managed to get myself on CNN. I was banned from the BBC. So I thought to myself, well, I don't know, really. You know, I'm, I'm shopping. I don't know. I'm busy. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll come on if I can go on live. Yeah, no, we, we can't, we, we've already got the schedule, but, um, you know, but, uh, but we'd really, really love a, a snippet from you now, if possible. I said, no, 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 if I go on live, I'll do it. If I can go on live. All right, so she went away. I've got another phone call. Uh, Hello, it's uh, so-and-so from Joe Wiley's show. Um, chatted to Joe, yes, we're going to fit you in at 12 o'clock. Oh, fantastic, brilliant, thank you very much. So, anyway... I went on to Joe Wiley's show, and it was live, and, um, and I thought, right, okay, I've managed to sort of offend people with my t-shirt, I've managed to get chucked out of the BBC for swearing by proxy, 
Um, and I tried all sorts of weird and wonderful things to make sure that people remembered who was this idiot on telly or radio. Because if people remember it, if it's rem memorable, they'll talk about it online, they'll tweet it. I'd rather, rather me being bought some boring social media idiot going, yeah, I've got a really big Facebook group. I just thought, well, no, at least, at least, you know, at least I can sound like an idiot or I can, you know, I can say something out of turn. So anyway, live on Radio 1, uh, Joe Wiley asked a question, well, I hear Simon Cowell didn't like your campaign very much and I heard he called you names. Um, let us know what you think of Simon. And I was live, I was live to the nation, Radio 1, and I thought, well, well, actually, Joe, I, I'm very disappointed with Simon's attitude. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, I've not been personal against him, and I've wished him the best of luck, clearly. If he was to look online, he'd know that none of us are, are anti-Simon Cowell. And he's completely taken it the wrong way. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, if it wasn't anyone else, I'd be quite upset about it, actually, if you must know. Um, but I wish him every success. And um, I think The X Factor's a great piece of TV, uh, TV show on Saturday night. So I'm, I'm really, you know, I think he's, he's just picked on me. And it obviously it Fox Joe Wiley. <laughs> She's like, oh, right, okay. All right, well, would you, I'll tell you what, do you want to introduce the, because um, we've played your track, so we, we, we've got to be fair on here, so will you introduce Joe McKeldry? Yeah, no problem. So anyway, so, so, okay, off you go. <laughs> so I said, uh, listeners, I said something like, uh, so listeners of the, uh, the UK, Make the right decision. Here is the uh, Christmas number two, Joe McElderu. And I, sp I said his name wrong on purpose. <laughs> and, uh, you can hear Joe, Joe, uh, Joe McElderu, and you could hear her. And she just said that, but it was fine. Because I thought, if I say that again, I'll get on Twitter. People will talk about it. Um, it's something to say, OK? And it worked. So that was great. I got my shopping in. I went home. And, uh, and this happened. <laughs> I, was, I was cooking fish fingers for my kids. <laughs> I was cooking fish fingers for my kids. And, um, <laughs> and my phone went for this really weird, really weird phone number that came out. I was like, what the hell, who's that? So I answered it, because my phone was going off left, right and centre at that time. It really was just nuts. I was getting newspapers ring, I was getting radio stations ring. Um, I felt vaguely popular for the first time in my life, actually. <laughs> Yeah, one R, look at that. Um, so the phone rings. He goes, hello, it's, uh, hello, is that John? Yeah, it's, it's Simon Cowell here. Right. <laughs> I just wanted to say that uh, I may have thrown my toys out the pram a little bit earlier in the week, and I realised I probably shouldn't have done that because I see you used it against me. Well done. <laughs> That's what he said. He goes, well done. Got to say. <laughs> You know, so it's good enough for you, Simon, and uh, <coughs> Mr. Clifford. Um, and it's, uh, yes, he, yeah, he, yeah, he got in touch with me during that week. Max Clifford got in touch with me that week as well. And um, I'm very glad that I didn't really follow that on. Um, so, yeah, it goes, but uh, well done. Um, I just wanted to say that I've been in this music industry for a long time, and I, I hope you don't mind me saying, but I've had a lot of people trying to break me and bring me down. And um, when it looks like the chance it might actually happen, it's some, someone that's not in the music industry from the middle of Essex that uh, has never released a record in his life. Um, and that, I find that quite intriguing. So, do you fancy coming to work for me? <laughs> <laughs> I said no, obviously. <laughs> you know, he offered good money, but... It's not very punk, is it, to say, oh, yeah, no problem. I've got 1.6 million people in a Facebook group, and I'm going to go and join you. No, because then you're my boss now, and I like the fact that I'm possibly one ahead of you, and it's going to stay that way. And he, he actually went for that as well. He's like, okay, I, I respect that. Anyway, so Simon, right, we had a really good chat. I'll be honest, we had a really, really good chat for about 20 minutes, and this was about, three, as I said, three hours of the chart to go. So this is about 9 p.m. on the Saturday before Christmas. And we said goodbye, and I said, you know, I said, good luck. And Simon did say something to me, which um, I, I heard from a third party, so I did actually believe him, in the fact that it was that close. The chart race was so neck and neck. Um, if any of you, uh, say, are privy to the figures, I know you are, so, you know, you're nodding down the front here, but the chart, you, you'll back me up, the chart was, was that close, wasn't it? The, the 2009 Christmas chart was ridiculously close. It was very last minute. And um, anyway, so it was very close. 
But there's one thing Simon didn't know, and there was one thing I didn't tell him, um, was the... Uh, remember I talked to you about, said about learning the rules, about reading the rules back to front. I know it's boring, I know it's boring as fuck at times, but knowing the rules means you know exactly where the weak points are. And it also means that you can maybe twist things a little bit and get away with it. Anyway, this uh, is probably not a well-known album cover, but this is the Rage Against the Machine live album that they released a few years previously that sort of did all right, but, you know. But it was online, and you could, you could buy that. And you could buy tracks from it. And one of the tracks was Killing in a Name on there. And because I read the rules, I knew that as long as the same artist and title were correct, that counted. And it counted as a separate download for everybody because it's a different version. So it counts separately on the digital charts, on the iTunes charts, on the Amazon charts, but when it comes to the real chart, they count it together. So I thought, well, hang on a minute. So if I encourage everyone to go and buy it again, because this is three hours to go, don't forget. So most people have bought it by this time, and they're all sitting on their hands, all excited, going, oh, you know, I hope this is going to work. So with three hours to go, I changed the group logo to pink, and the reason why I did that is because I thought suddenly people would just take a step back thinking, what the fuck is he doing now? And I wanted to do that on purpose because people would look at you thinking, what the hell's going on? And they did. And they checked into the group and they realised that I'm telling them, all right, guys, you've already bought it once, now go and buy it again. Three hours to go. Let's see how many we can get. So that's what we did. And um, we did 72,000 sales of the live track in three hours. All right? Three hours, 72,000, right? Now, bear in mind that 72,000 sales is enough to get a number one single, usually, in the other 51 weeks of the year. That's just three hours we did that, okay? Half of that get you number one. Sorry? Half of that get you number one. Well, half of that get you number one. There you go. Right? He's, he knows, yeah. So half of that would get you number one. Um, so 72K in three hours. This is, uh, and these figures are from Martin, who's the boss of the charts, by the way. So I, this, that was gospel. So 72K, so did it make a difference? Um, well, the X Factor, we, once we finished at midnight Saturday, the X Factor did 450,838. And we did 502,672. Uh, so about 50, you know, 50 odd thousand. So if I hadn't read the rules and done a little bit of checking out and keeping going and not stopping and not resting on laurels, we'd have lost it. We'd have lost it at the last minute. But because we did a massive surge and a massive buying surge and made a reason for people to want to do this, um, we donked them by 50,000, so we won. We got the Christmas number one. And um, just to let you know, the total budget spend was zero. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's not, is that mine? Beautiful, thank you. Excellent. <laughs> I should do this more often, shouldn't I? Right. Um, zero pounds and zero pence is what the whole thing costs because the internet costs, well, I was paying my ISP anyway because I use the internet, so there was no uh, costs on that at all. A couple of train fares, but actually I had, because I worked in central London, I had a, a, a ticket paid by my, my company anyway. Thank you, Richard Sounds, for that one. So, um, zero pounds, zero pence as well. And also, um, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is we did a charity donation at the same time. Once we got to a quarter of a million fans, we realised that people, we noticed that the chart, sorry, the song had gone into the charts the week before at number 80. And so I had to sort of say, what the hell are you doing? Don't buy it yet. Buy it next week. Okay? Who's buying it? In fact, if you, if you want to spend some money, if you've got some money burning a hole in your pocket, here, put a quid in the box. Uh, we, we did a just giving. I said, put a quid in the shelter box, right, it's for homeless, because it was Christmas time. So I thought homeless is a good charity to think about. And um, at the end, we, we did £163,000 for shelter. And incidentally, that's still coming in. We're still getting, the, the page is still there. And, and uh, astonishingly, um, we're still getting donations nearly four years later. Well, it's four years later. So we made all that much money as well, and, and um, we, I did a little bit of a mini documentary on how the money was spent as well, which was really nice. Um, so, yeah, we did, well, there's the headline news for the following morning. Um, we made pretty much the front page of every newspaper, 
And what I liked in particular is that uh, I, I was actually... I was actually at BBC TV Centre because they'd, invi they'd invited me back, you see. Because <laughs> they thought, well, we've got to have him, really. So I went on the morning, and I went on to... And again, this is all on YouTube. I went on to uh, Bill Turnbull and Sean, what's the name, on uh, BBC Breakfast. And if you see the YouTube video, I look absolutely fucked. <laughs> I really do look bad. I partied the night before big time. Um, and anyway... I had to be at work for nine o'clock. I couldn't come in later for work. I had to be at work still for nine o'clock, even though I'd just broken the Guinness record for the fastest selling download ever. Um, I had to be at work the following morning at 9 a.m. And so the BBC blessed them, because maybe they felt bad about banning me. They, they chauffeured me <laughs> to my, where I worked in London Bridge. And there was a little news agent's opposite the office, so I thought, well, I'm going to go and buy all the newspapers. And I did, and I bought every single newspaper with me on the front of my campaign. And I went into my office, sat down on my desk, slammed all the papers down, and I didn't say a word. And I just got on with my work. And everyone stared at me. Literally, everybody just stared and didn't say a word for about half the day. Um, either they were scared or not, I don't know. Marketing didn't touch me for a year. They, they still ain't talking to me now. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, and that's the only time I've ever bought the Sun newspaper as well, I have to say. I was going to try and steal it, but, you know, as a news, news agent, I didn't want to do that. So we did that. And then, uh, yeah, and then Rage Against the Machine kindly said, I'll tell you what, because we've, we've had such a big number one, not only are we going to give away all the um, proceeds for Killing in the Name, um, so they gave all the proceeds to Killing in the Name because they weren't expecting it, so they gave all of the uh, royalties, the lot, to um, British charities which was really cool of them, actually, because they, they could have you know, got a few, few quid out of that. Um, they didn't make anything, and if anything, they lost money because they decided to put on a free concert in uh, Finsbury Park, London, the following year, which was fucking mad. <laughs> it was just crazy. And that's me, you probably can see, but that's me on stage um, with the, the check for shelter, because we did an on-stage sort of uh, presentation thing. And um, we'd start, we, well, it was a free concert, there's 40,000 tickets that were given away, and they reckon 25,000 broke in. <laughs> they just broke in. Um, because it's Rage Against Machine, that's what they'd like, surely. So literally, there's videos on YouTube of people breaking into the concert, and they reckon about 65,000, possibly touching 70,000 were there. And it was just, to stand on stage, if you ever get a chance, guys, stand on stage in front of 70,000 people screaming at you. It's bloody brilliant, it's really good, you know. Fucking awesome. Um, I hope it happens again. Maybe, I don't know. So, free concert, and that was the pinnacle for me, to sort of stand on stage in front of that amount of people with one of my favourite bands ever uh, after a, a, a Christmas number one that I would never would have dreamed of would have ever, ever happened in a million years. And that all started, if you remember tracing back, from me just having an idea on the computer and just chancing my arm. So, just having a go, you know? What's the worst that can happen? People can turn around and call me a wanker. Okay, fine, right, no problem, but I had a go, you know? And that's what I just kept doing, and creating stories and layering on top of each other. And so, with the Chinese whispers effect, if you like, from me saying that, uh, you know, from one computer, that, that's all it was, one computer went down at some silly little radio station, and just building on it and building on it and building on it and making it a bigger story than it really is. And remember with the Facebook groups as well, none of them were mine, I stole them all. But... Thousands and thousands of people knew about my campaign because I just played around with things and tried it. And it ended up with that, which I'm still very, very proud of. Um, oh, next, next one, please. Um, so how do I think it works? Okay, this is not a, a, an exhaustive list. And this, I, to be honest with you, I change my mind every time I do this talk. So, uh, but um, a couple of things, really. I think to gain, what I mean by gain the troops and keep them is... I gained the, tr the troops, I brought the people in to do this. Um, I sold it to them. I said, if you do this, it will create that. But we've all got to do it together. And I tried to make it as simple as possible. Um, make your voice heard somehow. As I said, I was very dodgy in some of the dealings that I did. And I made sure that, uh, that my voice was heard. Now, if I played by the rules, my voice probably wouldn't have been heard as loud as it was, but hey-ho, um, I'm not very good at rules. So there you go. So if you see any rules, break them. Fuck it. Um, mistakes are great. Mistakes are brilliant. 
all right, seriously, make mistakes. They're just, they're just one of the best things in life, because, um, and that's for everything. Because as long as you learn from it and work out where you're cocked up, everything's great. You can just hone it and fine-tune it. And again, that rage campaign was honed and fine-tuned from a, a complete disaster of a Rick Astley campaign, where people called me a knob and stuff like that publicly, you know? Um, the PR I mentioned earlier, and I, uh, fake it to make it if you have to. If no one's hyping you up, make it up. Just get away with it. Don't be seen to be making it up. That's the trick. You've got to be stealthy. Um, clear communication, can't stress that enough. Really can't stress that enough. Um, if you want them to buy your, your music, if you want them to um, come and see a gig, if you want them to come and do that, whatever, just blatantly tell them. You know, there seems to be a thing in social media where, oh, no, you mustn't sell things. You, you've got to engage and you've got to be... Oh, you, you know, you've got to engage in... Yes, that's all very well, but, but for fuck's sake, you've got a product, just sell it, you know? That's, that's, if they've liked your page, then they've already bought into half of that. Um, oh, next, next one, please. He says... There we go. Yeah, where did it go to? Um, afterwards, if anyone listened to Six Music uh, radio station, we went... Um, uh, not long after the Rage campaign, I started a campaign to... I started it, there was about six of us that started it in fairness, but I started the Facebook group where we tried to, the BBC were threatening to shut Six Music down, and so we created a bit of a campaign, we had 180,000 people in it, um, to basically write to the BBC Trust to say, no, you're not doing that, we like this. And it worked, and they kept it open. Um, I, got, I got invited to Parliament to, to talk with Tom Robinson, um, who's one of my idols, and to, to go to Parliament and chat to Tom, with Tom Robinson about this, uh, again, is something that sort of sticks in there, really. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, I got to, oh yeah, I've got Ronnie Wood. Ronnie Wood's manager got in touch with me to say, are you the guy that did the Rage Against Machine thingy thing? Uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, Ronnie's, Ronnie loves that, and um, the Stones are re-releasing an album soon, and uh, they're wondering if you'd like to, if, if they could do it the way you did it. I was like, fuck me, yeah, all right. Uh, so, um, so I went along to Universal Studio, or Universal in, in London, in Kensington, and um, they put me into a tiny little room, and basically they played me three tracks that, it's so rock and roll this, I don't know how true it is, but apparently Keith Richards found these master tapes in a sock drawer in France or something like that. Um, something like that, something nuts. That they'd, they were so high at the time in 1972, they'd forgotten they'd recorded them. And so they went back in and tweaked them a little bit, and they tacked them on the end of Exile on Main Street, which is one of their greatest albums, in my opinion. Um, we managed to get a million fans on their Facebook page, because their Facebook page was a bit naff at the time, so we tweaked that a little bit. Um, we did something for Record Store Day, and when the album came out, it went to number one. Just, just. It beat Muse by a, a, a hair's breadth. But I didn't care, because that went straight on my CV. Um, but I'd worked with the Stones. Anyway, I never got to meet, meet any of them, unfortunately. But, um, but that's something I'm quite, uh, quite proud of, that we got, we got part of. And again, it, that was just because of the Rage campaign, that they liked that. Um, there we go, yes. Um, <laughs> we did uh, the 20th anniversary of Nirvana's Nevermind, one of the greatest albums ever created, in my opinion. And um, it happened to be around Christmas time, so we sort of semi-made a Christmas campaign, sort of, um, where they re-released Smells Like Teen Spirit. So we sort of made it into an anti-X Factor thing. Um, it, it, sold, it got top ten, didn't get number one. But um, again, I got to work with Nirvana's catalogue team. And when you're a Nirvana fan, that is, that's pretty bloody good, you know. So I was really quite proud of that. Um, and um, a few little pranks. Social media is brilliant. What's the best one? Which one? What do you want? The prep one. I'm about to tell the prep one. Yeah. The pre this is Ian's favourite one, so I'll, make this, I'll try and make this as, as concise as I can. Um, are you all familiar with pret a manger sandwiches? Yay. Hooray! Cool. Right. You'll like this one then. Um, pret a manger. And this is, again, this is a great example of learning your rules, knowing the rules of things. Excuse me. Mm. Um, and if you're going to go on Facebook and do a campaign, if you're going to do a competition on Facebook, know your rules. Pret didn't. They're silly. They got an agency in that didn't know what they were doing. And what they decided to do is it's their 25th anniversary. So it's a big thing. 25 years. 
And what they wanted to do, to be up with the kids and, you know, really social, is they're going to have a competition for who can design the best sandwich, okay? And um, whoever is deemed the best sandwich, that sandwich will be made in every prep in the country, even the ones in Holland, um, and I think France, they've got some in France as well. And that's going to be special packaging, it's going to be their 25th anniversary sandwich. Big fanfare. But what they did wrong was that they decided to judge it on Facebook likes. Silly, silly, silly. So they said, right, well, you know, write your recipe down. If your recipe gets the most likes out of all of them, you're the winner. And I thought, well, that's, that's a bit stupid. Um, so I checked out when the chart, oh, sorry, the chart, it's on my head, uh, when the competition was finishing. And they, fin they were going to finish it midday on a Friday. So I waited and waited and I checked out this, this competition. I kept checking in now and again. It had been going for weeks and weeks. And um, so we, it got to the Friday. And I thought, right, OK, uh, you know, there's no, no time like the present. Uh, we've got three hours to do this. I'm going to try and get more likes than the current winner, which was about, I think, 800. I think it was 832 or something like that, right? Then, the sandwich, yeah, this sandwich that was winning at the time, was they, it called it the half moon. It was like a round half moon shaped sandwich with cracked black pepper and oh, avocado fried chicken. Oh, it's lovely. It really did sound quite tasty, actually. Felt sorry for the guy. But anyway, um, he was winning. By, this guy was winning by miles. And, and apparently, from what he, he, I had heard, that he'd actually spent on Facebook ads to promote this competition. The prize, by the way, was not only that your sandwich gets made, was that you get six months free prep. You get a card with just, you can go in and you can have whatever you want. You just put your card, they'll slide it, off you go. Lovely. Yeah, I know, yeah. I found out who my mates were at the time as well, my fake ones. Anyway, so with, with an hour to go, I thought, right, I better end this competition, really, because I actually entered. What am I going to do? So I thought, well, what would be more annoying and more trolling than my competition entry would be one word in capital letters. So in capital letters, I wrote bacon <laughs> with, a, with a full stop after it, just to make absolutely sure that that was my design. That's all I wrote. That's literally all I wrote. I didn't write anything else at all. Bacon, enter. What I did is I then took the URL for that comment, made it nice and short using Bitly. Bitly's brilliant. Made a nice little Bitly link, tweeted it, sent it to the Rage Against the Machine guys in my group, I said, hey guys, who fancies sticking a thumbs up or finger up at the corporate? Yeah, come on. Um, all I want you to do is like this comment. I don't ask questions, just like it, and I'll explain in about an hour's time or a bit later on. So I sent it there, sent it to the Rick Astley group, sent it to the dog walkers in Vancouver. Um, you know where I'm going with this one, don't you? Twitter, the lot. Anyway. Um, yeah. Anyway, competition finished at lunchtime, and um, 3,800 likes. Uh, so I trounced the other guy by 3,000 likes, and I won. <laughs> so Pret had to make their 25th anniversary. It was a PR disaster for them because they had to make their 25th anniversary sandwich it was a bacon salmon. <laughs> Yeah, we went the day, um, I've known Ian a while, we, we, came, we went along to the opening, the, the grand launch of this sandwich, and they put his, they put his sign up, didn't they, and he said, our new sandwich, the bacon sandwich. <laughs> so, oh, God. And some frets, you can still get it in the mornings, apparently, they've stopped doing it at some, you know. Once the, because the story's got out of how it happens, so I think that, you know. Um, so, so there you go. So, so learn your rules, guys. If you're going to do any competitions on Facebook, Twitter, etc., anything like that, know what you're dealing with. Because um, I've fucked up before, and Pret fucked up big style there. And, um, and we, we had feasts, didn't we? I mean, we were just scoffing. We just would go in and... I'd buy coffee for just random people in the shop. It was just the most amazing time. I was like, that queue? Yeah, I'll buy all that. Go on. No, it's on me. Seriously. Um... <laughs> Secret millionaire. Don't say anything. Um, uh, this, just on the right-hand side, you can see a vending machine. That vending machine is in Cape Town, South Africa. 
And this is another social media little campaign that some uh, digital agency thought was very clever, uh, that wasn't at all. And what they tried to do was that uh, this machine would dispense free cans of drink, absolutely free, if you tweet it. So if you tweet a certain hashtag, that will spit out uh, a, a free can of, I don't know what, I think it was iced tea or lemon tea or, or something like that. And um, I know I got wind of this. Someone sent it to me because that's what people do now. They just send me stuff that they want fucked up and I'll see what I can do. Anyway, <laughs> he sent this to me and goes, this machine is, is uh, giving out free cans of drink apparently. I said, like, oh wow, let's have a look. And anyway, I worked out quite quickly that it doesn't, you can't just tweet it and it gives out the cans. It detects your location. So it looks at your location on your phone and if you're in the area, uh, the vicinity of the free machine, and you tweet the hashtag, bang, out it comes. So anyway, um, I found a cool little app on my iPhone where it will fake your location, right? And um, so I sort of changed it around. Anyway, I worked out by looking at, because people had twit-picked twit this machine. They were encouraged by the company to, to, to picture the machine and say thank you to it or stuff. And working out through Google Street View, um, I worked out exactly where it was precisely where it was in Cape Town, which shopping centre it was. I put my pin right in the middle, right in front of it, and I started tweeting <laughs> with the hashtag. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, I tweeted a few times and I thought, oh, it's not working. And then I looked at some of the tweets and I started saying, oh shit, this thing's just spat this drink out and I was, I was walking past. How cool is that? Excellent. And, None of them had used their tweet. None of them had used the brand's tweet at all. So they weren't even tweeting the brand to say thank you. It was just spitting out random cans of drink. <laughs> uh, and then um, I decided to sort of explain to people the app I found where you could fake your location. And, um, and they had to stop the campaign within two hours because um, they'd run out. <laughs> it had all gone. Um, so, yeah, yeah, a bit naughty. But, you know, again, they just... You've got to make things watertight because I'm around. Um, very lastly, Condescending Corporate Brand. There's a page called the Condescending Corporate Brand page on Facebook. Um, it's more for big brands like your Tesco's, your, your BP, etc. And what we do on there, this was just a bit of an event from me. I, I hate crap social media. Okay, I can't stand it when I see a big brand going, oh, hey, isn't the weather nice today? Click like if you like sunshine. You know, or, um, you know, who's been born? Anyone been born? If you've been born, share this picture. Fuck off. You know, it's just shit. And so I made a page where it just did all of this, right? It just did the whole lot. And I made bad pictures purposely on... T it was terrible. I mean, it really was awful. Um, which was... I thought it was just a bit of satire. And it just it got it off my chest. But the problem was, some of the Americans believed it. And, uh, and the New York Times got in touch and said, Hey, man, are you, what, what, what product are you selling? I'm not, it's a made up, it says in the bloody thing, it's made up, it doesn't exist, it's just me venting, it's just a bit of a joke, you know. Oh, well, we're, we're from the New York Times and we'd love to interview you about this. 